Right now at 6.30, could it be the break investigators have long hoped for? A confession, the first confession, made about evidence in the Jody Husenfut investigation. Why, 25 years after she disappeared, this person is saying they're now, or what they're saying, and why they're now coming forward. Of course, this year marked the 25th anniversary of Jody going missing, and this might be the piece that unravels the mystery. At least the man who was confessed to is hoping that's the case. Thanks so much for keeping it with us tonight. We're in this half hour. We are focusing on this latest information, what it means and what it could end up meaning for all involved in Jody's case. We begin with a bit of background on the man who obtained the confession. This is not the only major break he has gotten in his search for answers. Steve Ridge is the former chief operating officer at one of the nation's top media and talent consulting firms who lived in Iowa for more than 30 years and followed the Who's in Troop disappearance. In the past two years, he has become a licensed private investigator in order to enhance his ability to look into this case. He's been working with officials, most recently at the state and federal level, to uncover the truth behind Jody's disappearance. I've interviewed Steve a couple of times this year, most recently before the July 17th execution of known Iowa drug kingpin Dustin Honkin, who Ridge believes may have had knowledge of Jody's disappearance. Ridge is the only reporter ever to interview key person of interest John Van Sice in the past 25 years. For the latest developments in this investigation, Steve Ridge is joining me from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. We are on pins and needles wondering what has transpired. Uh, certainly, um, there has been a fair amount of suspicion that has continued to hang over like a cloud, hang over the Mason City Police Department that goes back many years. And that's been acknowledged by uh, Chief Jeff Brinkley, who actually has asked for the public's help as recently as this uh, past uh, anniversary, the 25th anniversary of her disappearance. One of the people that I have been in touch with in the last month uh, confessed to me that they believe that they destroyed critical evidence uh, in the case in the days immediately following Jody Husentrude's uh, abduction. They have they uh, were interviewed by police uh, at the time uh, of the crime, uh, perhaps multiple times. Um, but they did not disclose what it is uh, they told me here just three weeks ago. So I've given it a little time because I have in fact been in touch with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Northern District of Iowa and uh, they had directed federal authorities to uh, conduct an interview with me to get the specifics and after follow-up conversations with this informant, uh, I was able to pass the information along. And so hopefully it will be worked into the system. And, you know, perhaps this could be the pivotal uh, kind of information that could uh, could turn this case. What did you uncover or can you say what led you to reexamine this person? Yeah, I mean, it's years and years and years, and so many people have been questioned. What was it about anything that you were looking at within the last six months that made you go back to this person? Well, as you work your way through interviews and new information, you have to kind of plant those nuggets or seeds and see where potential dots might connect. And I felt as though this person was probably in a very good position to have been to have had access to the key players uh, surrounding Jody in her final days and so as I drilled down uh, I slowly was able to learn and and pick a way that you know uh, this person had in fact been around and been uh, integrally involved and uh, then finally we reached a point, uh, a fairly emotional point, because this person had not even shared this with their family. Um, it's been, you know, a complete dark secret uh, that's been held back for now 25 years. I think um, sharing the information with me was a very painful, uh, emotional experience, which I've tried to be sensitive to. And uh, I think it is offered up, though, in really the spirit of trying to help perhaps finally resolve this case. 
I have a lot more questions hopefully you can answer. Steve, let me take a break and I'm going to come back. I want to talk a little bit more about this informant and if they're afraid of the law coming after them after having given you this information. Let me take a quick break and we'll come back with Steve Ridge, who has become a licensed private investigator following the Jody Who's in Truth case and the disappearance and the investigation surrounding it. As we know, this year is the 25th anniversary of her disappearance. Steve has uncovered some very important information from an informant. Steve, can you talk to me about um, this person without revealing who this person is? Could this person who gave you this information be in trouble with the law for holding on to this information for this long? Well, I think there's always a possibility that um, uh, that could happen, but I don't think that this is what I would characterize as a, an overt effort uh, at obstruction of justice. Um, or necessarily was in any way complicit in the crime. I think it was a matter of uh, immediately after the fact, a uh, substantial amount of panic set in. Uh, there was, uh, I believe, heavy questioning by police. Um, and some of that questioning, I think, uh, scared this person. I mean, quite literally, they told me they were, they literally feared for their lives. Uh, having been questioned and, and not fear that the police were going to in any way harm them other than uh, obviously there always would be the potential of uh, charges. And so I think that may have played into it 25 years ago, but at this juncture, I don't think that there's any uh, real concern there. Uh, I think at this juncture, author even authorities are more interested in solving the crime and getting to the bottom of it and if someone has held on to something, which uh, Chief Brinkley himself has said, it's very likely people know things. This is not the in only individual I've talked to that uh, has some really good insight, but it is clearly the first confession that I have gained, uh, which I believe is entirely accurate. It melts with every bit of information I've obtained from every other source. I think it's highly credible um, and I think it, it could be very pivotal in terms of uh, nailing down the specifics. Since we are not going to be able to get specifics out of you about the information that this person has confessed to you, you believe this person is highly credible. Have you taken that information and spoken to Chief Brinkley or anybody on the local level? Where is this information now besides in your hands? Well. I will tell you that since this person had expressed some concern about who they had dealt with in the past, and you may recall that initially during the investigation, it was being driven by the Mason City Police Department with perhaps uh, some assistance from the state DCI and even at times the, DC, uh, the FBI. But because there was such fear uh, and trepidation coming out of this person, I decided to contact the U.S. Attorney's Office as a starting point and was able to sort of work my way through that. When I interviewed Chief Brinkley, he hasn't been on with the department too terribly long as far as leading it goes. And he had told me, like he had told so many other media outlets, that this was a high priority. And then we heard, just within the last six months or so, that Mason City Police were looking at closing this investigation. That raised suspicions, in my mind, about why they would do that. Are you hearing that? And is this going to kind of probably stop any effort to close this case on the local level? Well, I don't think it's very likely. I, uh, the chief did allude to, and I'm actually reading from his statement, that uh, this, this case would stay sealed um, uh, and, and that any action on it would, be, would remain uh, private until administrative resolution. I don't think necessarily that there's anyone currently at the Mason City Police Department that uh, would like to see this case go any way, but to get solved. Uh, but it's just historically, there were so many issues around the department going back 25 years ago. And there have been a number of people who have left the force, who have retired, who have died, who have moved on. 
Uh, so I think that the Mason City Police Department is, is acting in good faith, but I think they're seriously handicapped uh, because this, there's an aura of suspicion. There are other flies that have been entangled in this web, and this new information could unravel that web even more. Stephen, let me take another quick break. Uh, I want to talk to you about Jody's car. We'll come back, talk about that in just a couple of minutes. Um, some information that someone who was questioned 25 years ago or somewhere around the time that Jody disappeared uh, and you went back and re-interviewed this person and got a confession out of that this person. That is the new information that is coming out today. You are working with federal and state agencies on this and uh, we think that there will be much more coming out from this case. Jody's car uh, was towed away and never really even thought of again. What made officials finally say, you know what, we're going to go looking for a car and how they found it? Well, uh, it actually was uh, not officials. It was uh, some folks that are associated with findjody.com, which is the website that's dedicated to um, solving this case. Uh, and the people that I know very well, very fine people who out of curiosity and by tra uh, tracing the VIN number and all of that, were able to find the current owner and actually go and inspect the car. Um, but the fact of the matter is there's, there's no residual value in the car and the police could have tracked it down and brought it back in at any time. They had fully processed the exterior of the car, believing that uh, the perpetrator was not ever in the vehicle, um, nor nor was Jody at the time of her departure. So, which probably is a, is a pretty solid bet, actually. However, the chief did admit, Chief Brinkley admitted that uh, perhaps allowing the car to go back to the family so soon and not keeping it, particularly in light of now how uh, DNA evidence has evolved and how many things have changed. Is there suspicion around it being uh, taken away, towed away, how it was towed? Is there any suspicion involving the car from at the time when it was taken? I don't believe there is other than the question of exactly how the car was obtained and how it was financed and whether in fact it was a gift, which there have been some speculation about. But I think, I think the police have a very, very good handle on what transpired relative to the car. My last question is going to be after our final break. I want to know what's next and when we're all going to find out uh, what you know. So give me two minutes. We'll be right back. We have devoted this entire half hour to speaking with private investigator Steve Ridge, who has followed the Jody Husen True disappearance most specifically uh, and more thoroughly in the last couple of years, uncovering uh, some information that came from an informant who confessed information that uh, has not been known up until very recently. Three weeks ago, I think you said you got uh, this information, Steve. So uh, it is in the hands of state and federal federal authorities, what comes next and when will you be able to speak of the details and when will we know who this person is? Well, uh, my intent is uh, to allow things to take their course, their natural course, uh, and to allow uh, the police to work through the evidence and see how it may connect with other bits of information that may not be public. Uh, certainly, they have a vast file, uh, which has never been made public, probably appropriately so, given the fact that it's an active investigation. Uh, oftentimes, key details, which have not been disclosed publicly, are uh, the details that will trip people up eventually. And certainly, um, knowing some things that were not public prior to my interview with this individual, uh, I became quickly convinced that it was totally credible. Uh, and that it's very solid information. And I think it provides insight uh, on several levels. And I, I believe that this will continue to fuel uh, an investigation that's going to result in uh, an outcome here that, uh, in terms of identifying a perpetrator. There are people who knew Jody, who have been interviewed, who continue to talk about her disappearance. Uh, through any anniversary when uh, remains are found. 
uh, who have gotten a hold of me uh, over the last seven months or so indirectly to tell me anything that you have found, anything that you say is um, a crock. Well, let me just be flat out point blank. And that I shouldn't be listening to you or talking to you, which makes me more suspicious of the people who say that about you. Uh, therefore, that leads me to this. The last time I spoke to you, I said when new information gets found out, uh, it could get people who have been holding on to information to talk because they could uh, be in less trouble if somehow they were involved and they hear that things are starting to come out. So <laughs> they could say, he's saying this, he's not giving any specifics because he's trying to get those of us who do know something to crack, to talk. What do you say to that? Well, I think there's always going to be speculation and uh, a jealousy around information that surfaces and what the source is. And, and, and that's just not my motive. I mean, my, my mode of operation is to try to get to the facts, to try to get to the truth. Uh, I have given Jody's sister, Joanne, uh, an assurance that that is my goal. I've had her blessing the whole way. We talk frequently. But do you uh, think that they want to discredit you because there is that kind of involvement? The flies in the web, as I referred to earlier. Well, there, there could be some of that. Uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to say. I feel like I have to kind of tune out all of that noise because I think it can be a significant distraction. Uh, I just need to stay on point and definitely having done so, I mean, I have, I have found some very, very powerful sources of new information. Any chance that Jody knew, because we've wondered this, that Jody knew some information around drug activity in that area when she disappeared, which could have been why she disappeared. Do, are you believing that more now? Well, I won't go as far as to say that I believe that's why she disappeared. I do believe that uh, drug activity permeated the community, and I think uh, almost everybody in the community was aware of uh, some level of activity. It, 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 it was everywhere. Um, and so, uh, but to bring the association of the, the drugs to the reason for her abduction, uh, I think at this juncture would be uh, a reach beyond where I would be comfortable going. Well, I do appreciate your candidness and willingness to speak with me about this new information. Looking forward to the next few weeks and to uh, unraveling it even some more. Steve, thank you.